as you cross multiple um, backends, you need the load balancer, so you need the extra hop anyway. And also, if you compare with the traditional old fashioned load balancers, uh, ambassadors actually save one hop because when you have, um, let's say, I have a client, I have servers, I have a load balancer in the middle, so the client connects to the load balancer and the load balancer connects to the back end, so you, you go across two network links. With ambassadors, you can have the ambassador local to the client. The ambassador is in the container right next to the client. So now you do client to ambassador over a local connection and then ambassador to backend over a remote connection. So it turns out that the ambassador saves a link. Um, I think it's, it's in the Netflix architecture, they call that like a middleware application load balancing or middleware application proxies or something like that, which is this idea that when you need to connect to something, instead of going to some remote load balancer, you have the logic either inside the application or locally on the machine um, so that the, the, the stack actually becomes simpler. At first, it seems like it's more complicated because I have, let's say I have a cluster of 100 machines and now on each machine I have this load balancing logic. So it seems more complicated, but it's actually simpler because when you are troubleshooting problems, instead of troubleshooting from the machine to the load balancer and then from the load balancer to the back end, well, the link from the client to the load balancer is always okay because it's a local link. Like in the, in the Netflix architecture and in Airbnb smart stack, it's a connection of a local host. So that part is pretty easy to debug. Like for instance, it's in, in smart stack, what the, the general idea is I want to connect to MySQL. So MySQL port is 3306. So I'm connecting to local host 3306. And on local host 3306, I have something that knows where my actual MySQL is. And that thing will also deal with the primary, secondary failover, and that, that kind of thing. All right. Oh yeah, and reliability point of view. Um, in a traditional setup, the load balancer is a single point of failure because if the load balancer goes down, then it's nice if you have 10 backends, but if you have, if the load balancer is broken, you can't talk to the backend. With ambassadors, the, the load balancer is co-located with the client. So if the load balancer is down, it can be because of two things. Either the machine is down and <coughs> you don't care because if the machine is down, then the client is down too. So it's not, I mean, of course you have a problem because the client is down, but there is nothing you can do. Um, and if, if the machine is up, but the load balancer is down, so the ambassador is down, it means that HF proxy crashed, which can happen, but is really, really, really rare. And generally, if you find a way to make HF proxy crash, it means that you have another interesting problem. Um, and uh, the, the bottom line is that um, com com the traditional setup, you have like three points of failure, a client, load balancer, backend. Now you only have two, client and backend. Okay, um, inconvenience, so okay, so you still have one extra logical hop, even if it's not a physical hop, it's still a logical hop between the client and the server. Uh, it, it's not completely transparent. Um, you need to do backend health checks, but that's the case with all kinds of load balancers. And now there is one thing where ambassadors are um, um, not as good as normal load balancers. It's regarding load balancing fairness. So fairness is making sure that we send as many uh, connections to each backend to avoid like 10 connections on this backend, two on the other backend, and five, and then zero. And if you have one big load balancer, that load balancer knows exactly how many connections are going to the backend, so it can balance things. If you have many small load balancers, uh, each load balancer only knows its own connections. It doesn't know how many connections the other load balancer are sending. 
So then you need a mechanism of back pressure. So uh, the back pressure is when the when when the um, the load balancer does the health check instead of just getting okay it's alive or no it's down it's getting an information about the load and that way each load balancer knows the load of the back ends and can make better decisions to send traffic okay um, one last thing about ambassadors is that ambassadors is not the HA proxy with the shell script to generate the configuration ambassador is a design pattern and there are many ways to implement it um, <coughs> There is, and this is like an arbitrary classification, but it gives you an idea <coughs> of the, the landscape. Uh, single tier ambassador deployment, it's what we have done so far and what we will do uh, this afternoon. The idea is I have a bunch of load balancers, and when I deploy um, new backends, new services, then I update the configuration of those load balancers. So I have a, a a, a big red button and when I push this button it runs a script that will uh, check the configuration of all the, the load balancers and update the configuration of all the load balancers. Advantage is that it's simple because it's, it's just like this script or set of scripts. Um, it's rather robust. There is no new service to deploy because uh, that you just run that thing when you need to. The downside is that you have to run that script each time you add or remove backend or services. As long as you haven't pushed the button, the services are not connected to the network. <laughs> then you have what I call two-tier ambassador deployment, where um, now you, you have a service that listens to the Docker events. The Docker API gives you a stream of events like, oh, this container has started, this container has stopped, this container has been removed, this, and so on and so on. And so by listening to those events, you can know, okay, uh, this container has started, and I see that this container is a backend for this service, so I should update the configuration of the load balancers to add this backend, or, oh, I see that there is a new container, and this container needs to connect to those services, so I need to stop load balancers, ambassadors, for this service. So the advantage of this method is that you don't need to push the big button to reconfigure everything when you scale or deploy applications. The downside is that now you have an extra service that listens to the event stream and you have to maintain it and when it's broken you are in trouble because you can't scale up, down and deploy. An example of that is interlock. So <coughs> Interlock is a program doing exactly that. It, it listens to the events API and it can set up um, load balancers and it has a um, plugin mechanism so that it can set up a chip proxy or something else. And then three tier ambassador deployment, that's even more complicated. That's when you still have something listening to the events API, but now when it sees services coming up and down, Instead of directly uh, setting up load balancers, it, um, it stores the information into a configuration database. Uh, so typically we use something like Zookeeper, ECD, console. And then you have another uh, program that looks in this configuration database and will uh, take care of configuring the load balancers. So why do we want to have this extra intermediary step? it's to uh, decouple the two processes so that um, if at some point, so it means like the, the, the thing that feeds uh, the container information inside console is pretty simple and that one will be robust and you don't change it and it puts everything into the container database and then you, have, you can have different mechanisms, for instance you can have one for HTTP backends working with HF proxy or Nginx then you can have one for uh, Postgres uh, instances and instead of using an HTTP load balancer it will use like PG pool or PG bounce. You can have one for uh, Redis replication using Redis Sentinel and so on and so on. So you have more flexibility, you can use like the, 
the, the best load balancing or the, the, the best mechanism for each kind of service. What about uh, the uh, database services like Elasticsearch for Cassandra where clients are really smart enough to do client-side load balancing because they know the data localities? Right. What's so what case? about yeah the, the services like Elasticsearch or MongoDB where the, the, the client knows the is, is aware of the multiple yeah, okay. yeah or Cassandra yeah. Um, so for Elasticsearch uh, I, I think it's basically plain HTTP so what I think what people do is really put like the HTTP load balancer in front anyway. If uh, well, uh, the best practice for Elasticsearch is to use uh, 9300 port, which is uh, the binary protocol, uh -huh. uh, not it's non HTTP. That's basically the gossip protocol between uh, Elasticsearch servers internally. Uh -huh. And uh, if uh, <coughs> if uh, people do Java applications, they do 9300. <coughs> and this uh, doing the benchmarks, uh, it's. Uh, uh, more performance uh -huh. uh, to work through this uh, gossip uh, TCP protocol port, but like, so, uh, what's the case when uh, what's the case with Docker networking when we need to know actually the all the host of Elasticsearch with right. the application? Okay, if if your application needs to be aware of all the the the, the backend nodes, so basically if the backend nodes are just like uh, copies of the same thing, in that case we will most likely use overlay networks. Mm -hmm. where where you know the addresses of all the containers. And in that case, you don't need an ambassador or a or, or load balancer. Mm -hmm. And we will, see that, that we will see that this afternoon. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, and other multi-host communication mechanisms. So overlay networks are mechanisms so that um, you can have a bunch of containers on multiple hosts and those containers can ping each other directly. So that will address exactly this, this use case. Uh, right. <coughs> so Docker for Ops. So we're going to put Docker points on the side for a bit. Um, and we'll um, talk about a few um, concerns about <coughs> um, wh how, how do we do backups, logging, stuff like that. Um, so here, um, unless you remove all the containers, you still have the MyRedis container up and running. If you don't have it, you can just start it super easily. And what we want to do is back up this container. So the traditional method would be, okay, you SSH inside the Redis server and you install like a, a prompt tab entry so that every hour or every day you tell Redis to dump its database and then there is a dump file and you copy that dump file to S3 or to another machine or to a, a tape drive or... Um, here, what we want to do is we want to achieve the same result but without touching the Redis container. We don't want to change the Redis container. We want to have that Redis container... Um, um, uh, well. The, we, we don't want to install the tools inside the release container. So I will show how that works. First, <coughs> let's make sure that we are talking to the right machine. Yeah, I have the my release container here. And I'm going to start a special container. So I'm going to explain what all those parameters are. find the right size. Yeah, okay. that would be okay. So Docker run, dash dash link, my Redis, colon Redis. So it means that I'm going to start a, a special purpose backup container. This backup container will be able to talk to the Redis container using the Redis DNS entry. I'm going to use volumes from, which means all the volumes that the my Redis container has, I want to have the same volumes. And then I'm putting an extra volume here. So dash v slash tmp slash my redis colon slash output. That means that in my container, if I create files in slash output, 
I'm actually creating them on slash tmp slash my redis on my physical machine. Oh, well, on my Docker machine. Sorry. It's not a physical machine. Well, it's, it, it's copy online. Is that um, no, the volume is not copy on write. It's just a, it's just a pass through in the file system. I, I will show that in action, and I think it will be more clear. So when I start this, it's just an Alpine container. So there is no Redis running in it. Like that, this doesn't. Yeah, it's independent container. However, it it can access the Redis containers in two ways. First, over the link. Like if I do ping Redis, this is pinging the Redis container. And also slash data, um, I know that this is slash data because I looked at how the Redis container is made and it, it, it defines slash data to be a volume. So the Redis container is using slash data to store the data. And since I use volumes from, slash data is also visible in my backup container. Except <coughs> um, here, Okay, so there is a lot of activity going on on Redis. Um, yeah, what I want to show is that here, the dump file dates from 1054 GMT and it's 1055 GMT. So I want to get um, um, an up-to-date dump. So first, I will connect to Redis. Telnet Redis 6379. So I'm connecting to the, to the Redis um, API. And I'm telling it, do a dump of your data now, save. Tells me, okay, quit. And now if I list data, it's 10.55 um, because it dumped the data. All right, so, but now uh, the data is in slash data and I want, it, I want to get that thing out of this container. So here, if I wanted to put that on S3 or AirSync to the machine or SCP or FTP, I would install whatever I need in this container, in this backup container. In that case, I just want to copy it to the slash output thing. I'm going to go to, to slash output, sorry, slash output, um, make a directory backup of Friday and then copy slash data slash dump into this backup of Friday directory. And then I'm going to exit that container. And now if I look in slash tmp slash my redis, I have the backup of Friday directory. So here, the method that I use to get the backup out of the container is just this, this volume, but um, in a production scenario, that's where I would like use again S3CMD or WSCI or AirSync. So the key idea is that without uh, changing anything in my Redis container, I was able to make a backup and get the backup out. So. Imagine we are on EC2, so I want to send my release backup on S3. Uh, so I would do a small container image that would have my favorite S3 tool. So maybe S3 CMD, maybe AWS CLI, maybe Python and the Boto library, whatever. And I would have a small program that would connect to Redis, just send the save command, then copy the .rdb file locally, and then um, copy, upload it to S3 in my backup bucket and then exit. And so now, when I run this container, it does a backup cycle. So that's, that's how we can make backups um, without affecting anything, changing anything uh, in our uh, production environment. This is a concept that we will see a lot when we talk about Docker in production and everything. It's this idea that instead of um, putting all the tools and scripts and everything inside the, the container, we have another container sitting right next to it and sharing <coughs> some things with that container. Um, and the, the upside is that 
if someday you say, okay, now we're switching from S3 backups, we're moving to a GCE. So in GCE, it's not S3, it's the Google Object Store. So instead of having a lot of leftovers in your Redis container, like in your Redis container, now you have all the tools we were using on S3 and also the tool we had when we were on a dedicated machine and, and so on and so on. No, you still have a clean, simple Redis container and the tools that you need are in a, a, a kind of sidekick container right next to it. All right. We did all the steps. So, yeah? yeah in this case, the, uh, the image should run on the same machine. In this case, yeah, the image would run on the same machine for a couple of reasons. Um, the main one is that we use volumes from, and so if you want to share volumes, you have to be on the same machine, yeah. So yeah, you, you still have to be on the same machine, uh, but the, um, the we can compare that, like previous situation was I have my VM, I have Redis, and I have my backup thing. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, I have my VM, I have Redis, I have my backup things, but they are in different containers. So when I decide that I want, if I change my backup strategy and I remove the backup container, there is nothing left behind. So logging. <coughs> there are two big strategies when uh, logging with containers. Uh, one is to log like old school in normal files in a plain directory. Uh, so in that case, you make that directory a volume so that you can share it with the host or with other containers. Or you can log to STD out and then the container runtime is gathering the logs and sending them somewhere. And the somewhere is the thing you can configure. So logging to plain files, um, th that part is not hands-on. We will do hands-on with uh, logging to STD out. But if we were logging to plain files, we'd say, okay, let's say we will log everything into the slash logs directory. So we start a container with dash v slash logs, which means slash logs is now a volume. And now if we do docker run volumes from the container, in that other container we can access slash logs. So when you need to do some log analysis, instead of entering the container and installing your tools and so on and so on, no, you start <coughs> the separate containers, but that separate containers also has access to slash logs. So if you need to install uh, ACKGREP, uh, Apache Top, um, all your favorite log analysis tools, you do that in a separate container. Now logging to STD out. Um, so <coughs> when you do that, Docker um, collects the output of the containers and then it uh, feeds that output to a logging driver. The, um, the logging driver mm -hmm. can be set globally and also on a per container basis. So there is a global option that applies to all containers, but you can override it per container if you want. The two options, so dash dash log driver and dash dash log opt, um, those two options can be used both when you run the Docker engines, when you do Docker daemon, um, then you can do dash dash log driver or syslog for instance. But you can use exactly the same options when you start an individual container with Docker run, <coughs> dash dash log driver, syslog, blah blah blah. And you can set the per container option um, in Compose files. <laughs> so what drivers do we have? A JSON file, so it write into files in a JSON format. Uh, that's the default driver. Then syslog, well it's using the, the good old syslog protocol. AWS logs, it's using the AWS API, so then you can get the logs in CloudWatch. Journal D, so that's the thing of system D. GELF, uh, which is a protocol which was introduced by Craylog, I think, uh, which is a little bit more um, sophisticated than syslog because it's, it's, a, it's a structured log format, so instead of just being like, this is one line of log, it's a key value. Um, each, each log entry is a key value thing. 
uh, FluentD and Splunk are similar in the sense that it's more structured than plain text. So the default JSON file format, um, it has one good thing and one bad thing. The good thing is that it supports the Docker logs and Docker Compose logs command. So it's the command that lets you ask to Docker, give me the logs of that container. It's the only one supporting that. Why? Because let's say that we use um, syslog. If you tell to Docker, send the logs of this container over syslog to a remote machine, then the logs are gone. Like there is no way for Docker, I mean, there is no standard way for Docker to talk to your syslog machine and say, hey, give me back the logs of this container that I sent to you five minutes ago. It's a, it's a one-way protocol. So um, if when you do Docker logs, uh, blah, 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 to get the logs of container, blah, 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 if it's JSON file, Docker can just open the files and read them. If it's on syslog or something else, it has no way to get back to those logs. So that's one advantage of JSON file. The inconvenient is that it's not centralized because you're writing to local files. And it, by the, the default config doesn't rotate logs. So if you just leave it in production like that, it will fill up your disk, guaranteed. Um, if you really want to use JSON file, you should at least set both Mac size and Mac file options, um, which will make sure that the engine rotates those log files and removes the old ones. So JSON file is typically used in dev, because in dev you want to easily have access to the logs, but once you're in prod, you <coughs> usually use something different. And so here, that's what we're going to do. We're going to set up an ELK cluster. So ELK is this kind of famous logging stack uh, it stands for Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Um, just to make it clear, this is not like the official method or anything. It's just because I wanted to show that in action. And I say, okay, ELK is a very popular stack. So I know that there are probably many people here who are curious to see what ELK and Docker would like together. Um, but this is just because I wanted to have one demo and I could have picked something else like syslog or whatever but so don't imagine that this is the official way uh, the official logging stack for docker it's just an example so what we will do here um, we will start the ELK stack and we will use compose to make that easy because I mean we could app get install Elasticsearch, app get install Logstash, app get install Kibana and set up everything, but no, we will use Compose directly. Uh, then we will set up the Kibana web interface, and then we will send manually a few leg entries to make sure that everything is fine, and then we will reconfigure the Docker Coins application so that it sends its log to the cluster. All right. Um, so, if you're not familiar with ELK, the idea is that we have Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch, <coughs> it's, a, it's an indexed document store, so it stores JSON documents. Here, a document is just a line of log. So it will be a small JSON hash with like the log line, the timestamp, the, the host that sent it, and uh, other information like that. Um, then we have Logstash. So Logstash is a kind of... Uh, uh, a log pipeline processing thing. So it has inputs, outputs, and filters. So inputs are protocols that you want to use to accept logs. So for instance, you can have a syslog listener, a GDLF listener. You can read from pipes and files and sockets. Then you have outputs. So you say, I want to send my logs to plate files or to Elasticsearch or to a RabbitMQ exchange or whatever. And then you have filters where you can transform the data that goes through. Um, so, and, and Kibana is the web UI. Here, we will use the default config for Elasticsearch in Kibana. The only thing that we will configure is Logstash. And the configuration will be done um, through the Compose file, just to have like, the, the smallest amount of work. All right, so, um, 
<coughs> to start the ELK stack, it's in the orchestration workshop repo. There is this ELK directory. And I'm just going to do docker compose up dash D. So it's going to pull Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana official images and run them. And if we look at the at the compose file, So the elastic search part is relatively easy. <coughs> Use that thing. The Kibana part is also pretty easy. Um, I'm setting the elastic search URL because by default it tries to connect to localhost. And also I'm, I'm exposing port 5601, that's the, the, the port for Kibana's web UI. And then here that's the complicated part. Uh, that's the logstash command. So here um, normally, we wouldn't do that. We would have like a nice little configuration file and we would put the configuration file in the container and run it. But since the configuration is not super long, I decided to embed the configuration in the container. <coughs> so, um, I, I suppose that not everybody is a Logstash expert, and I'm not a Logstash expert, by the way. I just wrote that after reading some docs for a couple of hours. But this configuration, um, so I, I told you inputs, outputs, and filters. So inputs, it accepts log entries using the GELF uh, protocol on a GLF socket using the default thing, so port 12201 UTP. So it means, okay, you can connect to this logstash thing. Well, not connect because it's UTP, but you can send UDP packets on 12201 and it, it will receive them. Then there is heartbeat. Heartbeat is not a real input. It's a fake input that generates one test message every minute. It's just convenient for us to, to see that everything works fine. Then we have two outputs. We have the Elasticsearch output, so every uh, log entry will be uh, written to Elasticsearch. And there is this STD out, Ruby debug codec thing. Uh, you will see in the logs that this means Every log line going through Logstash will be printed with STD out, again, for debugging purposes. And then the filter here, so that filter is super weird. It's to work around um, the fact that in Elasticsearch, the keys can't have dots in them. And um, sometimes um, when logging messages, we will have dots in the keys. Um, you can ignore that. I mean, if you know Elasticsearch and Logstash and everything, what I said maybe makes sense. Otherwise, feel free to ignore it. We could remove that and it would still work. But then, um, for instance, if you start logging container labels, that would break. So, and when I say break, it doesn't mean that the stack would crash and burn. It just means that you would lose log messages because Logstash would drop them. Or rather, Elasticsearch to be more accurate. Anyway. The, um, the hmm? For in this case, you have the configuration here. But in uh, other cases, would you recommend <coughs> creating your own container, extending the original one, and then copying your configuration file in? Or right, what, what other... would I what would I recommend for an actual deployment? What I would probably do is I would have a, um, a logstash directory, um, and in the in the compose file, I would put like. Logstash, instead of putting image logstash, I would put build logstash. And in the logstash directory, I would have a Docker file that would do from logstash and then copy the config file in the right place. And that would be pretty much it, I think. Okay. Either that or, or um, you could also um, bring in the configuration using a volume. It kind of depends if the configuration is, can change often. Or, or if it's like one set up once and never changes, that there is no best method. Um, it really depends of it many depends. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. So now, if I do Docker compose logs, uh, I see a bunch of outputs. So I have Elasticsearch output, I have Kibana output, and I have. This is the output of Logstash. So 
Those messages here are the heartbeat messages generated every minute, and this is the Ruby debug output. It's uh, so I see for each message, I told you it's each message instead of being like just a log line, it's key value within the timestamp and host and message. Okay, fine. All right, so my stack is up and running. So now Docker Compose PS. Yeah, logs, logs, touch, okay. Oh. So I want to see the port of Kibana, okay, 32769. So I want to connect with my browser to my instance address on that port. Kibana expert, so I just know that here we have to click on create <coughs> and then discover. So those are the, the logs that we were seeing before, like the heartbeat things. Uh, then what I want to do is uh, I want to show last hour and then I want to auto refresh every five seconds. And uh, that's it. And so normally, <clears throat> once every minute, I will see a, a green <coughs> appearing here. OK. <coughs> Click on all the things. We just did that. So now, what we will do is that we want to, to send um, something to Kibana to, to check that it works correctly. Uh, I mean, we want to send to Logstash so that it has an elastic search so that Kibana displays it. So um, the easiest way to do that is to run a container. In the container, we do like echo hello. And we set up the container so that the logs are sent to the GELF endpoint. So let's see exactly what this looks like. I do. Docker run, uh, dash dash rm, so this means this is a one-shot container and once it's done it should be removed, uh, dash dash log driver gelf, dash dash log opt, is it log opt or opt, opt, gelf address equal udp colon slash slash localhost colon the GLF port, 32768. Let's use the Alpine image and do echo, hello, we are getting hungry. Okay, and now if I go to Kibana, <coughs> after it, it reloads every five seconds and there is my message, hello, we are getting hungry. Let's send another one, echo, please send help and sandwiches. And a few seconds later, when it will reload. <coughs> yep, so <coughs> this is not super readable, so what we can do is here we can say, I want to see the host, I want to see the container name, and I want to see shop message. So all, all those blank lines are the hard bit every minute, and <coughs> Those are my test containers. Okay, so it looks like our logging pipeline works great. So now, what we will do is that we will set up the Docker Coins application so that it sends its log to the logging pipeline. Um, so I'm going back to the Docker Coin thing. Well, I still have a bunch of containers running here, so I'm going to stop all that stuff, kill all the things, remove all the containers, okay. Now I'm going to reset uh, the Docker Compose file to its original version. <coughs> and I'm going to edit it. And I will <coughs> add the GLF log driver and 
the GLF address uh, option to each container. So that's the part where once again, when you do it manually, it's like, mm, we need to script something here. So log log driver GLF log opt GELF address UDP colon slash slash uh, local host con 32768 and now I am copying those lines in every single service. And now I'm going to do docker compose up. And now in Kibana, I'm going to unzoom a little bit. Those are the logs <coughs> happily scrolling. So, <coughs> yeah. and that gives me, yeah, we have 150 lines of 200 lines per minute. So if we wanted to see more interesting things like to be able to only see one specific com the logs of one specific container and, and things like that, we would have to uh, create indexes and do some extra setup on Kibana and, and Elasticsearch, <coughs> but that's kind of outside of, of the scope of this workshop. I mean, this is not an ELK workshop, um, but that gives you an idea of what, of what can be done. The, the part for me that is really interesting here is that in like 10 minutes, we got an ELK stack up and running and we got our logs sent to the ELK stack. Of course, there are many things that we would have to change in production. Specifically, we would want to scale Elasticsearch. So instead of having one container, we'd have a bunch of containers. So we have to set Elasticsearch as a cluster. We would need to scale Logstash so that it's not a single point of failure. We would probably um, switch away from GLF and UDP because the problem with UDP is that you don't know if the other uh, machine got the message. So um, we would use some, so maybe some persistent message queue or something like that. And then what we would probably do, well, here you have two scenarios. Either you have many different logging stacks and each application defines its own logging parameters or um, you have one single Bing logging stack for everybody, and so you set up your engines to automatically send everything to your logs, uh, to your ELK cluster, and then when you start the logging containers, like the containers for the ELK cluster, you set them up with a different logging driver, otherwise the logs of the logger get re-injected, and so you get a feedback loop, and as soon as there's one log message, it, it creates an infinite loop of, of logging messages. So, okay, questions about logs? Yeah. I have a question. The job driver, for example, um, if you use TCP, because you also wait for the acknowledgement, if your REST search cluster is overloaded, uh, does your application also come to a halt because the workers start slowing down because it cannot process logs? Right, the question is if we are using like the GLF over HTTP, if, if the logging cluster is being yeah. slow, will that slow down the application? Um, that's a fairly good question. Um, one of the common answers is, is to put something in the middle, like a page in Kafka, that's uh, what people do. <coughs> so, yeah, normally that's one of the things that Logstash is supposed to be able to do. But um, I think, so, 
I think what I would do, uh, I so th this section is fairly new, like the the hands-on real key section. I wrote that like uh, last week, um, and so I. I, I thought a little bit about how would I do that for a real production scenario, and I think I would put Logstash on every uh, machine of my cluster because it seems to be pretty lightweight, and um, I apparently there might be a way to have this buffering in Logstash. So I mean, basically you, you do UDP, so it's UDP but UDP of a local host, so you don't lose packets, and then the buffering would be done by Logstash. Um, but I, to be completely honest, I, I don't have like production experience with large-scale ELK clusters. So, but yeah, Kafka is one way to do that. Um, what we did in the dot .cloud days is that we were using with with RabbitMQ. So you just drop the the logs on RabbitMQ, and yeah, it it worked ish. <laughs> Because you need persistent RabbitMQ queues and eventually. Oh, and they had, and uh, RabbitMQ actually dies when uh, you got eventually a <coughs> spike, so all the processing in cluster is going right. really down, and since it's not surviving uh, so far. Uh, so, what people used to do, they used to write the logs to Redis and then uh, Rep, yep. some demons, uh, either Logstash or something to read and uh, forward it to Logstash or uh, to Elasticsearch properly configured or having the uh, writing logs to Kafka and then reading them by Logstash and then uh, doing that in Elasticsearch, but it's all a matter of configuration right. of firewall yeah. ports because for Kafka you need to do Zookeeper Madness and the uh -huh. broker list and you need to tune applications that way. Uh, but if you write uh, some sort of scripts uh, to do that, so you will be able to have high performance logging with Kafka definitely. With uh, Logstash on our machines, not quite sure because uh, the Logstash instance, it's just the uh, thing that uh, transforms uh, mm, parts okay. of the logs and gets the variables from it and uh, sends it, stores it into Elasticsearch. Right. Yeah. So if I understand correctly, Logstash will not do any kind of buffering. Uh, it has, but it doesn't really. So it's a. Uh, uh, JVM, uh, so it's a JRuby uh, right. process, and sometimes it might suffer from memory leaks, and it's not really surviving big buffers. <laughs> from production experience, <laughs> it's not built for that. Man. Yes, so you want to have it in Kafka as soon as possible, basically. Right. <laughs> well, Splunk doesn't have uh, problems with buffering, but Splunk costs uh, a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay, so. Yeah. Is it possible to have um, multiple logging drivers, like the same container using multiple logging drivers? Um, I think it's not possible yet, but um, almost each time somebody asks about that, so I'm pretty sure eventually we'll have a way to do it. Yeah. Because it's not complicated anyway. So. All right, next section. So we are ops, and as ops we have to deal with security. Uh, how do we do security upgrades with Docker? This section is not hands-on because usually there is not a new shell shock uh, in the middle of the workshop. Except earlier this week there was the DNS resolver issue with Gilipsy. Uh, so that one was pretty interesting. Um, but this is to give you like, uh, okay, when there is a vulnerability, uh, what do we have to do? Uh, and you will see it's extremely simple and there is nothing fancy to do. Uh, first, we will see what if there is a security issue with the Docker engine, and then what if there is a security issue with a package in our images. So, um, when there is a security issue with the Docker engine, then we release a new version, and all you have to do is upgrade the Docker engine. And for that, I'm sorry, this will be really simple, but stop all the containers, stop the Docker daemon, then upgrade the daemon, restart the daemon, restart the containers, and that's it. There is one thing that I want to add to I will probably add a few details to that slide to give like a recipe so that you can get the list of running containers stop those and restart them nicely after restarting the engine. Um, so technically, at some point, it will be possible to restart the engine without 
uh, restarting the containers, but not yet. For now, you can imagine that the engine is a little bit like the kernel. When you want to, to upgrade the kernel, you have to reboot and restart the processes, but eventually, we will be able to work around it. Food is here, but we are almost done with this section, so that's good. Upgrading container images. So, when you have a vulnerability in some package, um, the first thing, and that will sound very obvious, but the first thing is to make sure that the vulnerability has been fixed in wherever you're getting the software. So, for instance, if um, like it's Lipsy, uh, there is a vulnerability issue, so you have to make sure that Lipsy is fixed in the base images. If it's lib something that you have installed with <coughs> get or yum or whatever, then you need to make sure that this package upstream has the fix. That, that sounds obvious, but it's better just to say it. Then uh, you repool the base images, the, the ones that are declared in, in from in your Docker file, you rebuild and you restart the containers. And that's it. There is nothing else special to do. If in the very like special scenario where there is a vulnerability issue and there is no available fix in the packages, uh, yeah. then you can you can do hot fixes in the images. So the traditional way, if you, if it's a normal machine, is you SSH into it and you hot patch things with containers. You can do that, but it's better in that case to take a Docker file and at the end of the Docker file you add the commands to hot patch the containers because that way. Um, when you want to, to remove what you did, you just have to comment those lines and, uh, and you're good. Can you comment on the... Uh, some people talk about system containers and application containers. System containers and application containers? Um, system, if you would set up uh, OpenStack or run a long-term database, you would uh, still patch the database and still uh, uh, update those system containers and mm. not uh, make them... Uh, well, right. <coughs> so, um, yeah, for application containers, it's pretty easy to have this cycle where we you stop the container, start a new one because it's stateless, and it, it, so you can have multiple ones and do load balancing, and so and, it, and so upgrading is very uh, painless. But if it's a database container, yeah, it could be more complicated because at some point they have to restart that. So what happens? Um, to be, to be honest, so in the beginning, when when you start to uh, kind of uh, get used to Docker and containers, generally speaking, uh, the, the time between I'm stopping this container, I'm upgrading, I'm starting again, this time can be long and it can mean service interruption. But once everything is streamlined, it's not longer than when you do slash etc slash init.d slash mysql restart or systemctl uh, restart Postgres. Um, in both scenarios, at some point, the process will be down and then up again. And so what we want to minimize is the time between both. So even if it's a database container, it's totally possible to have this thing where you stop it and start the new one, and the, the data will still be there thanks to the use of volumes, because the, the volume is the thing that will be carried over to the new container. So what you're saying is that system containers have no use <coughs> And that uh, mm. all containers could be uh, stopped at the time so quickly that nobody would, would discover the, inter uh, the interrupt. So, there would be maybe a couple of exceptions. One of them would be um, when you're taking a, a legacy server and you don't want to spend two weeks to break it down into smaller components and you say, okay, I just want to take that server and put it in a container. So then you will end up with uh, a system container. And that's totally fine. Sometimes you. I mean, you have like those 20 VMs and you're like, eh, they don't really need to be 20 VMs. They could be 20 containers and that would be fine, but I don't want to spend three days to nicely break down things. So you just take the root file system of the, of the VM and put that in the container and job's done. So that's one perfectly valid use case. Um, another one would be in those very rare scenarios where you have a service that is smart enough to be able to restart but not lose connections. Now a few servers like, uh, well, Azure Proxy for instance, you can restart the, the, the config and even you can upgrade Azure Proxy without losing connections. Um, the, the way it works is that it's smart enough to kind of, uh, uh, when it 
binds to the listening socket, uh, then you can have another process also binding to the same socket, so now the both processes receive the connections, and then the new one sends a signal to the old one to say, hey, please go away. So then the old one closes that socket, finishes to drain all existing connections, and then terminates. In that case, um, you could, well, you, if it's for reconfiguration, you don't need to do something special, like H, the H Umba container, it's using that mechanism. Uh, we will see this afternoon, there is a reconfiguration mechanism, so you can change the configuration and it will restart. It's still the same container. Though. If you want to upgrade, then that's a different story. Um, currently, <laughs> there are ways to do it, but they are really hackish, so I, I wouldn't really show that, but with uh, using like network namespaces, you could start a new container that has the same network namespace and could use the same trick to upgrade, but it's not very streamlined yet. I mean, it's, it's definitely something that if you, if you have a load balancer or some infrastructure component and you absolutely want to have zero downtime when you upgrade, you can, it's, it's doable to, uh, um, write all the process and the scripts for that to happen nicely, but in the generic scenario, that's, that's much harder. So, in that case, it might still be useful for a system container. But that's really like a corner case in a corner case. Right, so, <coughs> um, and last thing before we get the food, network traffic analysis. So, you know, when, when there is this weird thing happening and you have to use stuff like TCP dump, and grab, and load. Um, so here, you will see a pattern that we saw twice already for backups and uh, for uh, the, the, the old school uh, logging mechanism, which is instead of SSH into the the machine, app get install TCP dump and run TCP dump. We're going to have a sidekick container, and that sidekick container will be able to run TCP dump, but it will have access to the network interface of the container that we want to analyze. So, um, I'm going to use an Alpine container. So, I, I still have this Redis container. Yeah, my Redis is still here. I'm going to do docker run dash it dash dash net container colon my redis so that means stop this container in the same network stack as the my redis container and I want to use alpine so alpine is this super small embedded distro so apk update so that's the equivalent of apt get update or um update and then apk add I want ngrep ngrep is this awesome mix between tcp dump and ngrep and grep I mean and now I can do ngrep uh, dash tpdeth0. <coughs> oh, even before doing that, netstat dash nt, I see a bunch of <coughs> Redis connections here. But if I do ps or top or whatever, Redis is not here. It's just the network which is shared between both. And so now I can do ngrep dash tpdeth0 by line, pop TCP. So uh, that means sniff traffic on ETH0, break lines properly, uh, sniff TCP traffic. This is a BPF, Berkeley packet filter expression. And this is a regex, so you can grab any kind of traffic. And this <coughs> dumps the, um, the traffic going to my Redis container. And the nice thing here is that I don't need to uh, pollute my Redis container with those tools. Um, we had a real world use of that in the dot cloud days when we had some, sometimes some uh, big DDoS attacks and stuff like that. And so on all the load balancers, uh, we had uh, something that would sample like 1% of all IP packets coming in and write them to a log. And then after the attack, we would be able to get those files and try to understand what happened and what was the nature of the attack. And so back then, we didn't have something like that. So basically, on each load balancer, we would have to install um, ulog and a bunch of other tools. 
with that mechanism, you can keep your load balancer clean and nice and everything and add the traffic analysis tool right next to it. All right. And let's get food before we tackle dynamic orchestration.